the denominator, we use the same ratio, but in at stream two. So let's take the case of the of the uh, mechanical separation where we're separating liquid from solid, which often happens in, in mechanical separation. Our liquid stream, let's assume, is uh, so we have liquids and solids entering a species I and J. And then let's assume then that stream one is predominantly liquid leaving, with a little bit of solids remaining. And then stream two is predominantly solids leaving with a little bit of liquid. So just mentally, what would that separation factor look like for a, a separator that works extremely well? In other words, you've got a very pure liquid stream coming out of one and a pretty pure solid stream coming out of two. Just plug in some rough numbers into that equation and just prove to yourself what type of separation factor you get. If you're just working percentages, so let's take the solid stream, stream two, S, uh, XI in stream 2, big or small fraction, small, xj2, very large number or high percentage purity if you're getting a lot of the high degree of solids coming out of the two. So then that denominator, the xi2 divided by xj2, small divided by large, you're going to get a small denominator, or small numeric value there, the denominator of xij. And then in the numerator, you're going to get xi1 some very high fractions, so let's say 99% purity, 99% more fractions coming out in your, in your uh, stream one, and XJ, very low percentage solids, more fraction there. And so then your SIJ as a result is going to be a very, very high number. And we can often get from mechanical separations, numbers that tend to approach very close to infinity for all the So. Um, Separation factor for mechanical processes is extremely high. <coughs> and um, just a note here though, you can obviously select I and J the other way around and then you'll get a very small number. But by convention, we, we choose I and J so that our separation factor is, is a value over, over one. What, what's the separation factor of exactly one? What does that imply? <coughs> that we need to, uh, for some terminology we need, is um, what's called a mass separating agent and an energy separating agent. So separation processes, as we said in the first class, we, we separate because we're trying to counteract Newton's second law. I'm oh, sorry, not Newton's second law, uh, that we're going to use today. <laughs> we're counter counteracting the second law of thermodynamics, which, which indicates that, that things tend towards high entropy. In other words, separations are not going to happen on their own. Things left to their own devices are in fact just going to keep mixing and stay more random. But we need to add something to our system. We need to put some energy in or we need to put some mass into our system to create and, 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 and have that separation occur. So heat, a very, very common energy separating agent used in distillation processes. Liquid solvent, a mass separating agent that we'll see used in solvents extraction, or liquid-liquid extraction, if you want another <coughs> Pressure, another ESA. Where would pressure be used? Which type of unit of pressure? Flash drum. Flash drum. Pressure. Where we're adding pressure. 
pressure. So we're, yeah, so we're talking about something we're adding to the overall unit to create that separation. So where would we add pressure to create it? Reverse osmosis. Membrane. Membrane, so that's a classic one. Pressure filtration, which we'll um, look at in, in a week or so from now. There's a few others that you can look at. Um, vacuum can be pulled across, so it's often the opposite, well, it is often the opposite of pressure. Um, so in many situations, you can either apply pressure or draw a vacuum. Um, the membrane itself can be considered a separating agent. Um, the filter media, as it were, um, similar idea. Electric fields can be added. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, flow itself, creating a flow, although then you could argue that that's the same as pressure itself. Um, creating a temperature gradient, a concentration gradient, a gravitational field, whether that's a natural field due to the Earth's gravity or, uh, or um, if you create it artificially through a centrifugal force. And then just the addition of an adsorbent or absorbent, these are mass separating agents, MSAs, that are then added to the system. So the first assignment asks you to look at a few of uh, these mass and energy separating agents. So every unit we'll look at in the future, um, we'll, we'll identify what the, either the mass or separating agent is. So sometimes they may be both of them that are used in the future. The other thing to realize is that by definition, an energy separating agent is going to be used up to consume. So it's an ongoing cost that you have to incur. So there's your operating cost right there, is the ESA. What about a mass separating agent? We have to add some material to the unit to create the separation. Is that an ongoing cost or? Yeah, so there's many situations where we can recover our MSA and recycle it. So uh, you may have a, a distillation column where you've added an additional separating, a mass separating agent, and then you have a, fo a, a following unit operation and you separate your mass separating agent. So you have two, two separation steps. Recover your mass separating agent, recycle it back to the beginning to, to reuse. So those are some concepts we need in general. So now if we look at the mechanical separation section, in today's class we're going to consider sedimentation. We'll look at the screening of particles by the end of the week, the centrifuges and cyclones shortly after that. So that's about the, the next two weeks with the material. I'll just quickly mention two other separators that, uh, that you guys have raised in those papers in the class and the first week, magnetic and electrostatic separations. So, Magnetic separation, very widely used in, in many industries, but particularly mineral processing. Um, as, as mentioned there, you can get extremely high throughputs on these devices, and the longer you make that rotating drum, obviously the, the higher your throughput can be as well. But a typical throughput there is about three times per hour per meter of drum. Um, but these units, you don't just find them in the mining industry, I've seen them used at multiple steps in the pharmaceutical industry, we'll screen the raw materials, then we'll screen the intermediate, then we'll screen the final product. It's, it's, it's not to um, remove any magnetic material that we ex uh, expect in our feed, it's more to prevent um, the operator or mechanic who's worked on the equipment with his screwdriver and drops a screw into some, some of, the, of the conveyor belt and then that gets caught up later. So it's to prevent contamination from going through to the final product. So the food industry is, uses that a lot as well. So they'll screen all their raw material coming in, and then every so often throughout the flow sheet they'll have a magnetic separator there just to catch any um, foreign product that may have come in in the factory floor. Another separator then is electrostatic. So here we're applying the charge across the particle path, and that charge induces um, some traction over there to the rotating drum. Those particles then some will, will leave sooner, some will leave later, carry, uh, some will carry further as shown over there, and then you get your split. Sometimes in perfect. And another interesting application of this one is um, it's used quite a bit to separate husks <coughs> from seeds. So the, the softer, like for example, a peanut, uh, if you've got that outer shell, 
that outer thin layer is often attracted by electrostatic charges, and then the, the nut itself is, is not. Um, I'm not sure whether they use that actually to separate it, but that is a, if you, if you take a cone and you rub it, and you hold it near peanut shells, it will pull them away from, from the, uh, the nuts themselves. So there's a, there's a classic example of where charge is induced through the electrostatic current. Okay, so those are two mechanical separations I just wanted to get out of the way. Now let's look at, at sedimentation. And here at the front, I've got a bit of a demo going. I'm, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of sedimentation. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't come out quite as clear on the screen as it does here in, in front. But um, this unit over there, here on the right is uh, concrete. So just regular concrete you get from Home Depot. And if you, you can see over here, that layer of water that's, that's separated out. So I mixed this up about 10 minutes before class started, and that's how far it settled. Um, and it should settle to about here if I let it go for about four or five hours. So that total settling time from the top to about one third of the way should be about five, five to six hours for that to settle. So that's the turn of the residence time. I'll just mix it up and maybe by the end of the class we'll, we'll be a little bit lower here. This other one that I wanted to show on the left hand side, um, notice at the bottom that thicker layer. So you see about a centimeter thick white layer in the screen over there, so I'm going to mix that up right now to disappear. So that layer is going to come back and very quickly. But why is the rest of the why is the rest of the liquid still so turbid? So we're going to see that layer form quite rapidly in the next few minutes or two. <coughs> so there's a, a, a almost very, very rapid sedimentation occurring there. This is a just a dry water compound, in fact, mixed up in water. But then the rest of the liquid stays extremely turbid and, in fact, will never go clear. Now, I've, I've left this in my office for two, three days and the water was still this turbid white color. Why, why is that not separated out? Right, so there is a limit to what we can sediment in our heart by gravity. Uh, there's a number of this, this particle size distribution is extremely broad in the dry wall compound. There's a lot of very large particles. Those are the ones that have already settled at the bottom. As you can see that layer, um, it's not so clear from, from the screen, but there's about a centimeter thick layer down here that's already formed. Those particles separate up extremely rapidly. Then there's another set of intermediate particles that are still busy approaching the bottom. And then the rest of the liquid never <coughs> become clear, um, just because the, the Brownian motion and the in, in, the, in the liquid itself is going to keep those very, very fine particles sub one micron, so smaller than one micron, those are going to stay suspended and will in fact never settle out unless I do something additional. So unless I increase the gravitational force through say a centrifugal operation or if I was running this experiment on <coughs> Jupiter for example, then that, those particles would, would separate out um, so unless I apply some additional force to it, or I change the chemical environment to encourage those particles to agglomerate and form larger particles and then settle out, then, then I'm going to only achieve it in those cases. Okay, so here you can see already on the, on the unit on the right hand side, there's about two centimeters of clearer liquid at the top. So that clearer liquid we call supernatant. experiment at home if you go mix vinegar with milk. So uh, don't, probably not skim milk, but try 2% two, 2 or something like that um, and higher. If you mix vinegar up with that, you'll start to you, you curdle the milk and you'll see a very nice sedimentation actually occurring. It's, it's quite interesting to watch. Okay, so the definition here for sedimentation is the removal of suspended solid particles from a fluid 
And it will be quite clear that here in this course, a fluid will mean a solid, uh, sorry, it will mean a liquid or a gas. Okay, so fluid is not necessarily liquid. Um, it could be a gas stream as well. And we're going to do, do that by gravitational setting. Though in, in most of the examples here, it will be a liquid rather than gas phase. Two other distinctions that are made in the literature around sedimentation are thickening versus clarification. It's a bit artificial because there's no clear distinction where one begins and one ends. But in general, thickening is, takes place in a unit where there's a very high solids concentration of coming out of the bottom, out of the center. And it's a, usually a throughput that's much higher. So this is common in wastewater treatment processes in the flow sheets there. And then clarification also occurs in a wastewater treatment flow sheet. But there the distinction is we're, we're separating solids from a relatively dilute stream. And we're aiming for complete solids removal in general. Whereas thickening, we're really not concerned too much with what our supernatants that overflow may still well contain quite a, good, a high degree of solids. We're not aiming to remove that thoroughly. We're really aiming just to thicken the incoming flow stream and concentrate the solids up. That comes out the bottom of the unit, the heavier solid stream with now much less moisture, and then that gets treated in subsequent operations. So it's, it's a concentrating step, whereas clarification is exactly as the name says, we're aiming to clarify that supernatant from all the suspended solids. And very often, uh, we'll, we'll touch on the class uh, next time, we'll, we'll talk about flocculation or coagulation. This is where we're adding chemical compounds to encourage separation. Okay, so four or five references that you can use for this section, since there is no official textbook. The uh, Handbook of Separation Technology is available in the library. On, on, uh, you can't take it out, it's a reference book. It's a big monster, thousand page. Uh, Swarovski uh, is available online. Um, Gene Coppolis, there's a very shortish section in chapter 14. Perry's is a phenomenal resource on this, this section, so uh, download and read chapter 18 from the university's library subscription. And then, um, I don't know, I, I went to school in the British system, British system of chemical engineering, so there we have a set of textbooks called Coulson and Richardson. Volume 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and this covers everything. Basic chemical engineering, second year, reactor design, uh, separations, process design, engineering economics. So across the six volumes, they cover all these, uh, all the chemistry topics you cover from second, third, and fourth, and fifth year are covered in that set of books. So this, the section on separations is volume 2 and chapter 3 and 5. So that, that book is very hard to come by in North America. Um, you can get it on Amazon, you can also buy it as an ebook online. So um, I, I do recommend that book. It's actually quite, quite clearly ex explains many of the topics we're going to cover in this course. So those are just some supplementary uh, references for you. Other than that, these, these slides and uh, should should cover you quite well. Okay, so sedimentation. Really, the, the strongest place, uh, sorry, the, the most common place where you can see it is for, for wastewater treatment and for mineral processing plants. Um, uh, when I was in high school, my dad was designing a, a wastewater treatment plant for Coca-Cola in Swaziland, and I was sent to go help with one of my dad's colleagues to commission the wastewater treatment plant. So it was a classic sedimentation basin, and we're going to look at, at a bit of that uh, in the next class. Uh, how we design those, those sedimentation units. But those are units where they're treated, they're treating any chemical waste from a food production process or a, a manufacturing facility which cannot discharge their liquid waste stream directly into the municipal system. So they first need to be treated in some way. Um, and then the most common example of that is our municipal waste water. So the Burlington wastewater treatment plant, the Hamilton wastewater treatment plant, um, are, are very close by to us. They're easily accessible. In fact, the Burlington Wastewater Treatment Plant offers free plant tours at any time. So I, I do recommend that if you uh, want to see some of these units in a large scale. Other than that, uh, there's a number of good videos online to see, see it if you want to see it, see what the size of these units are and how they operate. 
but we also find them in a number of other industries. I've seen them in, in, in pharmaceutical industries myself. They're often used there to uh, resolve in all shapes, so separating oil droplets from, the, from other liquid droplets and other liquid liquid dispersions. Okay, so let's start by determining what factors are going to influence sedimentation. So here you've seen the sedimentation take place in front of you. We're now down to about five centimeters of supernatant over the period of time that I was speaking here. What would you list as important factors that influence the rate of sedimentation? So as engineers, when we're designing these processes, we're interested in the size of them. So we want to know how fast are, these, is, is, are things going to separate. And we really want things to separate quite quickly so that we don't have large units in our process flow sheets. So what would be the factors you can brainstorm here that would be important to influencing sedimentation? Yes? Viscosity of the fluid. Viscosity of the, of the fluid that is being, that the solids are being held in. Other parameters, yes. Density of of the fluid, yes. Size of the container. Size of the container, okay. Let's hold that thought, yeah. The dynamics. So if there's anything else moving around in the cell, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Great, yeah. So do we have stirrers or, or as we'll call them in practice, rakes? They're called rakes most often, yeah. Polyability. Solubility of the solid in the liquid. Yep. Okay, but uh, so this is a mechanical separation. We're not trying to dissolve. In fact, we don't want the solid to dissolve into the liquid. Probably, but it, it may have some effect on changing the chemical environment of the fluid. Right. Other parameters. Concentration of the solid in the in the vessel. That's right. Aggregation of particles. Yeah. So the the aggregation of the particles would, if they aggregate, would change in the effective diameter of the particle. Then the shape of the particle itself. Yeah, sure. Temperature, pressure. Temperature and pressure. And pressure. Those. How would those affect the unit? Well, I think that it would, uh, if the particle is soluble, it would change slightly. Okay, so so there's a change then from the temperature and pressure from the physical properties of the environment. So yeah. temperature most strongly will change the viscosity, for example, which is very good. Solubility, solubility in this section isn't isn't an issue. So it's come up twice now. So solubility is not something we're concerned with in this section just yet. What we're looking at here is, is a pure separation of solids from liquids, um, and we're hoping, in fact, the solid does not dissolve into the liquid phase. We're hoping that they stay separate from each other. Okay, so those are a number of good, good points over there. I think you covered pretty much all the ones that I've had there. The strength of the gravitational field is another one. Um, so, like I said, this sounds artificial, but it's actually not. People have looked at sedimentation on the moon. If we were to colonize the moon in the future, there's a whole different way of treating water that's going to be required over there because the gravitational field is much, much lower. So that's an important one. The other issue is the relative density between the particle and the fluid. So we raise the, the, the density of the fluid as being important, but also what's, what's important, we're going to see that in the derivation today, is that the density difference between the solid and the liquid phase, or the solid and the fluid phase is important. Now the diameter of the vessel and the mass of the particle have absolutely no bearing on the sedimentation rate. If I sediment in a, part, in a unit that's this diameter or a 30 feet sedimentation basin, the rate of sedimentation is not going to be affected. The only time that the diameter of the vessel does become important is if the ratio of the diameter of the particle size to the vessel approaches some number. So I think it's about 50. So in practice, we're never going to have particles that, um, we're not going to have a separating unit where that ratio is that low. Right, even a, even a normal 10 centimeter diameter vessel is well going to see that ratio. Okay, and then the effect from other particles is quite important, and we'll, we'll come a bit to that at the end. So let's go back to first year physics. If we look at a momentum balance on an unhindered particle, so this is a single particle suspended in fluid, uninfluenced by surrounding particles. 
So it's a very, very abstract, unrealistic situation. But it's giving us a baseline of, from where we're going to work. There's a number of forces acting on that particle listed over there. The first is gravity down, which is, proportional, is equal to m times g. In other words, the volume of the particle v sub p multiplied by the particle's density times the gravitational force. The buoyancy force. So gravity is pulling the particle down, but there's a, an imposing force up given by the buoyancy, proportional to the volume displaced. And that's given by the volume of the particle multiplied by the density of the fluid this time, times g. So very similar forces between number one and number two. The only difference there is that the buoyant force is proportional to the volume of fluid displaced. And, and it's uh, due to the density of the fluid. The drag force is an, an opposing force as well. So this is a, if I had to draw a vector diagram, gravity would be pointing down, the buoyancy force and the drag force would be pointing up. Those two forces are opposing the gravitational force. And drag force, we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay, so things we can increase and change are our gravitational force, potentially. We can change our fluid density, and our particle density is likely not able to if we can pick the fluid, we decide to mix the, the, the solids in, in some situations. And then the most, uh, the next one that we can have some influence on uh, is, is the drag. So that drag then is given by the, the, the usual formula. We've got the drag is proportional to the projected area of the particle, A subscript P. So this is the area seen by the fluid as the particle is moving down multiplied by the fluid density and the velocity of the particle squared. So the greater drag force, the faster the particle is, 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 is descending. And then we have the drag force coefficient, Cd, which is assumed to be constant during a period of time. Um, and Cd, that drag coefficient, is given by the following sets of equations depending on which region we're so it's a function of the Reynolds number. For a perfectly spherical particle, Stokes derived the first relationship. So for conditions when the Reynolds number is below 1, Stokes' law says that that drag coefficient is 24 divided by the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number, um, let's be clear here that the, that the length is the particle diameter, the velocity is the particle's velocity, the density is the fluid's density, not the density of the particle. So the Reynolds number in this case is due to the fluid's density divided by the viscosity of the fluid. So 24 divided by the Reynolds number is Stokes' law. So this is for uh, this is quite a common situation in sedimentation, is that we're we'll in the Stokes region, region one. So if we're if we're it's like a higher Reynolds number, the relationship changes a bit, and then after, after a certain threshold, after a thousand, that Reynolds that, uh, drag coefficient is constant, and then at even higher Reynolds number still, it's, it's, it, re it reduces to another constant. So graphically, over all the region of Reynolds number that we're, we're going to be ever concerned about, that's what that relationship looks like. So from very low Reynolds number up to about one, about head to the zero. So up to about this point, we can use the relationship that CD is simply 24 divided by the Reynolds number. There's a transition period over here between one and a thousand, where we use this more complicated relationship. So we, this curved region over here. And then from about a thousand onwards, it's a, it's a fair assumption to, to, to use 0.44. And then a, there's a sudden dip that, that stays for very high Reynolds number. But we'll never be in this region over here. Your particles are not going to settle that fast. The only time you'll be in that is if you're settling the solid in gas, so that, it, that that velocity of the particles is extremely high, but it's not going to be likely for any situation of practical interest. Yes. I'm just curious, like in a sedimentation tank, isn't the velocity essentially zero? Sorry? Like in a tank, like if it, like in your example up here, like you're not the water's not moving, the particles are not moving. Isn't your velocity zero? Okay, so what we're talking about is the period of time when I've just mixed this up and the particles start to settle. And we're also talking about a situation where there's 
a particle settling in an unhindered environment. So this derivation is not valid for a situation like this. Here, when this is going, this is, a, this is definitely hindered settings. So those particles are interacting with each other to some extent. So <coughs> if this were a far less concentrated solution, we're referring to the speed at which those particles are settling over there. And that's, it's often in the order of millimeters per second, or sometimes even millimeters per hour, the number of velocities we refer to. Yes. I would just name that velocity. Okay, so this is this is why we're we're deriving this. Um, we're going to we're going to do the following. So that leads into the next slide. Okay, we're going to use those 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 forces we just looked at over there. So we've got gravitational force, buoyancy, and drag. We're going to derive a momentum balance. So simple, a simple application of Newton's law, which says that momentum is going to be equal to the balance of the forces. So we've got gravitational force over there, which is uh, straightforward. The buoyancy force is subtracted. It's in the upward direction. So my, my frame of reference is in the downward direction. So positive velocities are going down. So we've got gravity pointing in the downward direction, buoyancy opposing the us, and drag force opposing us. Setting that to zero at steady state, in other words, we're saying the mass times the velocity is changing the time, the change in momentum over time. dv by dt is the change in velocity then at steady state, in other words, terminal velocity. We're deriving the equation here for the terminal velocity of the solid particle. That particle will experience a period of time of acceleration, but then very rapidly, within less than a few seconds, or, or often much, much less, less than that, it will reach its terminal velocity. So we ignore that, that very short period of time as the particle is reaching its terminal velocity. We're deriving the equation here for the terminal velocity, v, is what we're after, because we're solving this equation now for v. We can then substitute in the fact that the, the, the volume of the sphere is given by that relationship, the projected area of the sphere as seen by the fluid is given by that relationship over there as a function of the particle diameter. And then we end up with this, this equation. It's very straightforward to derive. And it illustrates exactly the forces, uh, sorry, it illustrates exactly the parameters that we, we mentioned earlier that will affect sedimentation. So sedimentation rates, in other words, the particle's terminal velocity and the speed with which those particles are setting is going to be exactly proportional to the square of, or the square root of, the difference between the densities. So if my particle density is say 5,000 and my fluid density is 1,000, that's a fairly large delta. But if I'm settling that particle in a fluid medium with higher density, I'm going to see lower terminal velocities. Okay, so if my low F is now instead of 1,000 from water, in some cases, we use uh, liquids that have density of about 3,000 to settle in. I've reduced that density difference. I'm going to see slower terminal velocities. As expected, there's my G, my gravitational force. So if I'm doing this on the moon or Jupiter or Earth, or I've induced a gravitational field through a centrifugal force that's much greater or smaller than, than G, um, I'm going to modify the terminal velocity. The velocity is, is directly proportional to the diameter. So smaller particles, smaller terminal velocities. And then in my denominator, I have the fluid density, which was mentioned earlier. And then I have CD in the denominator. Now CD we've seen as a function of Reynolds number, which is in turn a function of the viscosity of the fluid. So all of those parameters we mentioned a few slides ago, they come into this equation right over there. So all these terms, density, viscosity, strength of gravitational field, and the others that were mentioned here by you guys, very, very strongly come through that equation. So that equation is an important equation, not for the exact numbers in it, but more to understand if I increase the particle diameter, I'm going to increase the terminal velocity, and so on. So understanding what direction we're going to see an impact from the various parameters. That's the important part for me for this equation. If you substitute in the case when uh, we're in that Stokes region, when the Reynolds number is less than one, that equation simplifies out quite nicely. So I'll leave this to prove it to yourself. 
Um, I encourage you to derive that relationship over there. For the case when Reynolds number is less than one, then uh, we can substitute in there that CD is 24 divided by the Reynolds number and simplify that equation and we need to use the quadratic equation to do that. But this does lead to a bit of a catch-22. As uh, Braden said, well, why is this velocity important and how do we calculate it? Well, we see here that velocity is a function of CD. If I go back to that equation, I know my particle's density, I know my fluid's density, I should know G, I should know my diameter of my particle, and I know my fluid's density. The only unknown is CD. CD is a function of Reynolds number, but Reynolds number is unfortunately a function of over there. Velocity. So we've got a bit of a catch-22 here. So the way to solve this equation is, is through an iterative approach, where you pick you pick a region. So most easiest to assume is to assume you're in the Stokes region, this is with Reynolds number below one, and calculate CD. Um, so solve for solve for B, your velocity, calculate the Reynolds number, then check if your Reynolds number assumption was true. If not, um, you pick, you use that new Reynolds number you just calculated up here in step three, and re-estimate what CD is based on the new, new uh, region of the plot that you're in. So you repeat that two or three times. Um, there's a worked example in Gene Coppers, but they use a slightly different approach. Either approach, uh, the approach that I've listed here, or the example given in Gene Coppers, will will converge. But it is, the key point is that it's always going to be interesting. So this is one of the questions in the assignment that you can, that you can go through. And the reason why we're focusing so much on this terminal velocity is that what we're interested in when we're designing these units to sediment out, we're going to design that unit for the slowest particle in our system. So as, as we see here in this example of the drywall compound, his particles that are uh, settled extremely rapidly, so there's that one centimeter thick layer at the bottom that's, that's there already. There's a number of other particles of smaller and smaller diameter, and then the rest of the suspension is particles that will never settle out. But we're going to design that, that, that sedimentation basin to accommodate the slowest segment particle. So that's why we're after this terminal velocity, or at least an estimate of it. But as we'll talk about a bit more um, later on, and tomorrow, uh, sorry, in the next class, we're going to show how to estimate that, um, that, uh, that velocity. In practice, that theoretical equation we derived is never going to apply. Because we're not going to be sedimenting spherical particles in an unhindered environment. The reality is we're always going to have hindered settling from other particles. Our particles are going to be non-spherical, so that those, those relationships there don't apply anymore. We've got very high concentration of material, and so these particles will cluster up and settle with each other and form larger clusters and, and, and settle faster. With very concentrated feeds, the apparent density and apparent viscosity of the fluid environment is now actually quite different and much higher than just the, the pure fluid itself. The apparent density, as seen by the solids, is um, quite different. Also, as the material is coming down, fluid is being displaced, so we get these channels going in the other direction. Let's just take a look at that. There's a neat video um, that I've found to illustrate that. Very short. So take a look at this. This is a, a very, very hindered settling environment. Look at this channel of fluid going up. Look at these agglomerations forming, and they settle much, much faster than the rest of the particles. These are obviously non-spherical particles in a hindered environment. So Stokes' law and all those theoretical derivations we just looked at totally don't apply to something in that environment. So that's, a, that's an example of hindered sampling. So what are we going to do about it? Right, if, if all the theoretical derivations that we, we might have don't apply, how are we going to design and find, find a terminal velocity? And, and design a, pro, a process that's a, or a unit that's appropriately sized to make sure we can get sedimentation in the time we require. Lab testing. So that's a classic way we can always solve any engineering problem. If, 
theory doesn't work anymore. We're going to try it on exactly the unit that we want in the lab. So let's say we were designing a segment for this concrete water-based mixture. Theory is not going to apply to this. But I shake this up, and I've seen here that over a 15-minute period, it's settled by that distance. There, I've already got my sedimentation rate. Okay. We're using theory to, to help us, though. We're saying that from theory, we can easily prove that the diameter of this vessel has no impact on my, my design. So whether I settle this in a, in a unit here that's about eight centimeters in diameter, or I go do it in a large fish tank, or I go build a 30 foot sedimentation base for it, the settling rate is always gonna be the same. So that's, that we're using theory to help us there, but then we're gonna use the lab values, that settling rate, to derive our, uh, our, set, our settling rate, and then go on to derive the diameter of the, of the settling. So what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to look at that. Um, I will post this link onto the website. I, I, I will then want to show you class tomorrow. Um, but essentially this, what the shows, what that video shows is um, we've got a few minutes here, so I'll just take a look at the bit at the beginning. What we're going to do is, what's shown over here is we're setting, so this is unhindered setting, this is the, the theory that, is, that never applies. But this is what's going to happen in practice. As those particles settle, we're going to plot a graph of height versus time. Okay. And what's actually very interesting is that during that initial period, that rate of change of height versus time is constant. As the particles get to the bottom, then that curve starts to taper off. But for that initial period, it's a constant rate of sedimentation. And we're going to use that then to design and size our sedimentation units. Okay, so I'll post this link to this video online. Um, and you please take a look at it uh, this evening or before the next But it goes on there to demonstrate a number of interesting <coughs> um, separations in the lab. In particular, this one here with more, it's showing you here the effect of concentration on settling rates. So I'll post that link on the course website and we'll take a look at it.